Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Water Lad Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. And if you have been enjoying this podcast, please do me a favour and go give it a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to. That will be greatly appreciated. And also, as always, I have a few specials for you for being a listener. The first one is 20% off Pure Sport Products the most tested and trusted CBD oil in the world, used by professional athletes all over the globe. The oil is perfect for muscle and joint pain or even just sleeping at night and they have a whole heap of other products available too with a new wide range of nootropics sold here right in New Zealand. To get your discount, all you need to do is enter the code WATERLAD20 at the checkout and you are good to go. I'll leave a link in the description below so go get amongst it. Also, 20% off the WATERLAD coffee bean is there for you as well. For all you coffee lovers out there, Pomeroy's Coffee do the best bean on the market and they also do a special Waterlad bean which you can get your hands on with 20% off by heading to the Pomeroy's website. I'll leave a link in the description again and then just head to the checkout and enter the code LAD03 and then your fresh coffee beans will be delivered direct to your door. Anyway, let's get to this episode with this champion lad. Anyway, let's get to this episode with the champion lad. It's a good intro. Oh, what a lad. Well, today I'm joined by one of the most talented players yet to play in the All Black jersey. And after another standout NPC with North Harbour, the rumours are out at what's next for this outstanding talent. Over the past seven years, we've seen his form consistently improve while playing for the likes of Waikato, North Harbour, the Chiefs, and of course the New Zealand Maldives. He's also a very savvy investor, so I'm looking forward to hearing <laughs> this one. He is the great man himself, Sean Shooter Stevenson. Welcome, mate. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, um, don't go investing in DVD stores. Uh, <laughs> 2022 or 2021—that's for sure. But no, nah, thanks for having us, Jimmy Ma. It's a pleasure to be here, mate. Uh, you're obviously very popular with the Waterlad fans already after your prank with Jason Maradon at the Fiesta Video Adult DVD store. Um, what do you remember about that? Oh, to be honest, like it's quite a funny story because I actually, if Michael Allardyce didn't tell me like the whole story, like oh. It, truly believe that like i was it was obviously just before training and obviously i was thinking about training but obviously catching me off guard you know about this whole investment idea i was like yeah yeah sweet sweet like <laughs> i was just gonna get to training but yeah, if you call me after training a little bit more time to like talk it'll be all good but i mean someone must have tipped off um, Allardyce and if Allardyce didn't tell me and you call me up the next day and send me some emails, I probably still would have believed it to this day, to be honest. But yeah, not as bad as my uh, my cousin uh, Celeste's one, the old Jossie. So <laughs> can't. He, he takes the cake, I think. But yeah, mine was, I mean, if they played that a little bit longer, I probably would have got to that, that, that level. <laughs> yeah, John T will never be beat, I don't think. Mate, that one was one of the no. greats. But. Yeah, the thing that cracked yeah. me up was when you messaged me saying, oh, you dead set would have paid that 43K <laughs> if uh, we kept going with it. Yeah, I honestly, no, like, genuine lies. Like, I love I said tell me, like, after training that it was you guys, I would have obviously, like, if you called me the next day and started yarning about it, like, I probably would have got more, like, you know, in deep with it in terms of, you know, oh, this actually could be a good um, investment. But, yeah, <laughs> two hours of sweating, like, um, you know, Thinking about it was uh, enough for me, so I'm glad he told me. <laughs> oh, it's so good. But how have your investments uh, been going since? Have you got into any? Oh, no, no DVD stores, that's for sure. <laughs> but um, I bought I bought myself a, a water business, so I uh, got a water truck, bought a brand new water truck, and uh, went into business with my um, parents, delivering um, water to people on tank water and um, filling swimming pools on the North Shore, like all the way up to Omaha, if you know where that is, like, like Mahara anyway, so... Um, that's one investment I've done um, that I know is <laughs> that is uh, true and um, yeah we had our first summer last last year so a um, bit of a t- you know, few teething problems with a new a new business but um, yeah obviously looking forward to the summer where it's quite seasonal so just getting the truck ready now to get out there and uh, get some business done so nice yeah. nice that is a lot better investment than the yes videos that's for sure yeah 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 no yeah no civic videos or anything like that so we're good to go <laughs> but let's get to the footy mate um obviously coming off a pretty massive season with north harbour uh, mate your form was outstanding how did you find it yeah it was it was a good good season and 
in, in a way, you know, um, obviously playing a couple of games, you know, I had a bit of an injury where I was out for a few weeks um, during that super season and managed to get back for the all the later stages of it. But, um, yeah, I didn't get picked for those stages. So um, to come out in that mouldy All Blacks where I think, you know, probably kicked off that, that form in terms of um, starting, you know, um, and getting some consistent game time. Um, really probably kick-started that NPC season for me. And I think I was just more excited about coming back home. And Yeah, like it's a funny one there. Like when you come back to NPC, you know, when you've been playing it for a while, you kind of come back and you have that confidence because you've been doing it for so well. You know, even if you make a mistake, you can move on and, and still, you know, play a part in the game, you know. So... Um, obviously been around for a while now. It was just good to throw the pigskin around. Obviously, we got um, our boy Mark Talia back, Tazzy, uh, <laughs> which was nice. So it um, took a bit of pressure off me and, you know, our backline and um, had stars all over the show. And, you know, if everyone's doing their job, it makes it a lot easier for yourself. And um, teams obviously have to think about not just you, but seven other boys in the backline. So, mm. yeah, it's good. And, uh, yeah, it was an enjoyable season. Mate, one thing that really stood out for me was watching you guys play was – how reliant, like your team relied on your back three, obviously yourself, Mark Talia and Tavita Lee, all massive carriers, massive involvements in the game. Was that was that part of your plan or is that just what happened naturally? Because obviously Mumba's always looking for work naturally, but was it part of your plan to get the ball in your guys' hand as much as possible? Because I've never seen a team have a back three so heavily involved in a game. Uh, to be honest, mate, like we didn't, like some of the moves – and our, and our um, set piece and stuff didn't involve us boys. So um, I think, you know, like I said, like the three of us have been around for a while now. You know, we've clicked on to like, if we're not involved in the moves and how else can we impact on the game throughout face play and stuff like that. And like you said, Mumba just always wants to get his hands on the ball. And, you know, I guess he's a bit of a, like a ninth, a ninth uh, forward for him, a, a, you know, a, mm-hmm. a fourth loose forward in terms of picking going and getting around there and, um, you know, if we're creating stuff on the inside, we know that Tavita's probably going to score a hat-trick every game. <laughs> um, you know, it's just stuff like that. But, no, to be honest, we don't really talk about it. And, you know, us back three are pretty, uh, we're all pretty close. So, you know, we don't mind having a bit of a joke. And, you know, like, yeah, I think we're just all on the same page. And you know, Tavita and Mark are two world-class players. And, um, like I said, you know, if everyone's doing their job, it makes it a lot easier mm. for the person next to them and um, whoever's, um, creating something is always, uh, you know, the next uh, one over getting the, getting the meat pie. So, yeah, it was good. Mate, it was it was good to watch. And obviously your form was so good and they've just named the, the All Black 15 team. Um, many people surprised not to see your name in it. How did you feel when you when you saw that side? We, you must have been pretty gutted. Yeah, obviously pretty gutted not to make that team. Um, you know, I thought I you know, had a pretty good season and I think, quite a few other boys we would have been pretty disappointed to not make that team either you know probably wasn't just me that um, felt that way and yeah obviously I think other you know you'd be lying if you know I was to say that I wasn't gutted and, but yeah that's footy you know you're not the one that's choosing the team and I guess you just you know you got to move on and not dwell on it for too long because probably starts affecting other people in your life when you know you're a bit of a sad sack and mm. you know there's other you know other things going on in this world that you know are probably more important so yeah, obviously gather, but what can you do? Mm. So, what was the feedback? What did what what did you hear from them? Uh, to be honest, they had no feedback, no calls, nothing. So, really, um, so yeah, that, yeah, that was the end of it. Really, just that team getting named, and then yeah, move on. <laughs> True, that that blows my mind. That guys who are surely in the frame for that selection to not even get a phone call, and um, especially guys around your age, you know, that twenty five to. 30-year-olds who, you know, have been working away for a while now, um, cracking on the door to, to not get a phone call. That's that's surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, they've probably got their reasons why, but, um, yeah, I guess you just don't really know where you, where you are, think where you are on the picking order. So, but, yeah, what else can you do? You can't, you know, like I said, dwell on it for too long. Otherwise, uh, you know, probably doesn't help, uh, help yourself in terms of um, being in the right mental frame. Yeah mental side of things so yeah but I guess as a country we always talk about um, how many guys are leaving our shores and especially around that age and mate sometimes all it takes from these coaches is potentially a phone call to say how close you potentially are or what you could do to um, potentially get in there but obviously you're left in the dark and um, you know potentially searching yeah I mean yeah obviously everyone loves a bit of feedback in terms of you know how they can get better or you know 
where they see them or, you know, um, what what they need to do. But, you know, they obviously just stick to their ways. So, mm. um, yeah, what else can you do? Yeah, and obviously your form uh, impressed. Uh, one guru coach in particular, Wayne Bennett, uh, rumours are that he's given you the call. He's he's pretty keen on your services. How how was that conversation? Yeah, I obviously um, had a phone call from him, and I mean, yeah, it was daunting in a way, but um, quite exciting, I guess. And you know, um, getting a phone call from him because um, probably not many not many people do. So mm. yeah, obviously, it's one of those things where um, you know, it's like everyone, you know, you got to keep your options open and see what happens. And I've always wanted to play a bit of NRL before, and it was just like nice to get a phone call and. Yeah, you know, talk about turkey, and mm. yeah, it was good. Was the was the phone call pre-planned or like how did how did that all work or just randomly out of the blue? Yeah, it was ra- out of the blue to be honest. Yeah, just got a phone call and random um, number. Was it just a random number? A random number. True. Random you number. you yeah, love a so. random number phone call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a DVD uh, <laughs> uh, phone call, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was a Wayne. So no, it was good. So. He's obviously you know, one of the best coaches, uh, if not the best coach in rugby league mm. um, that people have seen. So that nah, was cool. Have you played any league before? Nah, no league. No league. So I've played tag and touch, obviously, like coming through school. And, mm. um, you know, I guess when you get to that age, and especially in New Zealand, like everyone just plays rugby. And then a few, you know, league scouts and stuff come and, you know, if you want to go down that that road of uh, playing league, then you just play first a thing and then, you know, most boys, you know, go to the dolls mm. and try crack it in the league. So, yeah, it's just always been rugby for me. But you followed it closely and apparently you're pretty gun on NRL fantasy and super coach and things like that. Yeah, obviously the boys love it, eh? Like, yeah, yeah 24 of us boys at Chiefs played uh, NRL fantasy this True. year. It's huge. Um, yeah, everyone just gets around it. Yeah, it's just one of those things and I guess there's so much of it that you just – watch you know it's always on the tv mm. you know throughout the weekends and obviously when you're going away for for rugby you know you've got a lot of downtime at night so you just obviously there's a few games on every night so you just sit down and have a geese so mm. it's good what position do you reckon you'd play oh i'd like to play either fullback or six but um your center maybe yeah options I think that, yeah i mean i think those positions probably suit me so mm. Yeah. Did Wayne Bennett talk about any of those, like where he saw you or things like that? No, nah, he guys just rang me up for a chat and just, you know, see what I've been up to. And, yeah, I guess just asking if, you know, I had thought about playing rugby league before and whatnot. So, yeah, that was about it, really. Just got to know me a bit more. And, yeah, I guess it's when you're talking on the phone, you can't really get that personal interaction and, yeah. you know, get down to the nitty gritty. But, that nah, was a good conversation. Yeah, did it get you? Did it get you excited? Excited about the potential opportunity to head over there? I mean, I mean, I remember talking to TJ before he was potentially off to the Roosters, and remember how excited he was around um, the idea of playing in the NRL. I mean, Geordie's obviously been pretty keen to give it a go as well at some point, but no one's actually done it yet. I'd be pretty keen to see someone actually do the leap and make the move, and hoping mm-hmm. it's you. Yeah, I guess it's an exciting um, prospect. I think like, a lot of boys talk about it. Eh? You know, yeah. like, it's one of those things that um, heaps of rugby boys want to go give it a crack. And yeah, a lot of people talk about it but never do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's obviously an exciting opportunity if it does come about. But yeah, like I said, it's you know everyone everyone plays the now fantasy, everyone watches it. So mm. it's just been always one of those things. That you're just like, oh, I wish I could, uh, you know, have a crack at it and just see what it's like. But you're currently contracted with the Chiefs for. How long? So when when are you potentially able to make that switch if if you decided to go that? No, I got I got one more year, so oh yeah, yeah, and one more year with North Harbour. No, I'm not contracted with Harbour yet, so oh, okay, um, yeah, there's just one year of Chiefs, so true. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. So. Could, could make um, them uh, switch for finals footy with the Dolphins <laughs> <laughs> potentially, but nah, yeah, so I guess it's just all come about recently so um you know obviously it's been a bit of a whirlwind couple of weeks you know with the all black 15 and mpc just finishing last week for me so mm. yeah i'm just cruising at the moment yeah what do you reckon the hardest thing to adjust would be switching over to league oh I'm not sure right? probably just the wrestling and um all that kind of you know that physical side of things you mm. know 
just obviously it's a lot more um, upper body based, I guess, like defense, chest on chest, and you know, on the ground, just wrestling and slowing down the ruck play and stuff like that. So probably just that. I mean, depending what position, I guess you play. You know, I guess you get, if you're on attack, it's quite structural in a way, but it's also quite open in terms of you know what you know if you're at fullback and sniffing around the rucks like you mm. do probably during union around you know nine and ten and stuff. So yeah. I guess it was probably that side of the days, just wrestling and stuff. Mm, but you'd be pretty excited about the fifth tackle options, putting up your big floater bombs and um, things like that. Yeah, well, I think like most people are, especially like even at rugby training, you're playing, you know, league, is there like before captain's run and yeah. you've got props trying to do float, float, you know, floating bombs and stuff <laughs> like that. So everyone's trying to, you know, get one of those in or try doing like magical, magical plays. What, which NRL team do you support at the moment? Like. Who do you, who's your team? Oh, to be honest, I don't really follow a team, mate. Like, yeah. I guess, like I said, like there's that, that much league on that you kind of just watch whatever's uh, going on, or you know, if you're at home and settling in, yeah, just watch whatever. Yeah, but that is I mean, a, that's a safe it. answer for someone with plenty of clubs coming circling over the next few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Nah. nah, so but yeah, like I said, like, I think everyone just watches it. It's just one of those games that people enjoy watching and. And obviously, when you get like a Storm versus Panthers, you know, it's always like living up to yeah expectations and everyone, you know, it's a good game to watch. Mm. Mate, exciting times, exciting times ahead for you. I'm looking forward to following it. And like like I said, I'd be, I'd be keen to see you um, do that switch. It would be awesome to see a uh-huh. union player um, jump over. But if not, mate, hopefully you start getting selected in some of these teams and we can um, keep you in this game. But... Anyway, mate, as always, um, pretty keen to hear your journey from the start, like see how you got to where you did and what your childhood was like. So where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in um, Whangapura, so like about 40 minutes north of um, Auckland, um, the Hibiscus Coast. So yeah, it's, I guess when you're heading up north like Ariwa ways, but your Hibiscus Coast, Whangapura. So um, did my primary school years up there, year one to six, and then went to intermediate at North Cross Intermediate. At the time, I think it was like the biggest intermediate in New Zealand, like it had about 1,200 um, pupils and it was a C7 year 8 so um, headed down to the shore and uh, I actually didn't get into Westlake which was like the school to go to so Westlake boys on the shore because I was out of zone and right. all my mates went there but missed out on that then we had a family friend that went to um, Auckland Grammar that lived in Gulf Harbour so he would ferry in every day and then um, bus up to to school at Grammar but applied out of zone to get out of zone and then um, managed to get an interview to um, the hostel there at boarding school so managed to sneak into there and yeah did, did my um secondary school year, years at um Auckland Grammar so just kept heading south I guess and then obviously ended up at the Chiefs and Waikato but yeah yeah no I loved I love my time at um all those three schools you know yeah I couldn't couldn't speak highly enough of the, all those schools that I went to so were you always a gun at school like were you were you a gifted kid coming through the age grades oh I'll probably, I wasn't like gifted at all like I um yeah, obviously had some a little bit about me, I guess, but um, I wasn't big or I was like, well, I think I played, when I had my first year, year eleven, at first of being like I was probably only like fifty five, oh, no, maybe not fifty five, maybe like <laughs> sixty kgs, like True. dripping yeah. wet, like yeah, I was honestly so skinny. And <laughs> at grandma, like everyone thinks it's a private school, it's a public school. Everyone thinks that we do like seven or eight sessions a week, like Hamilton boys or St Kent's at the time, but literally we only did like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday training. And then maybe one gym, if that, and I didn't go to the gym at school. Like, it was just not for me. <laughs> and it probably, it probably showed because when I went down there, when I went down to Hamilton, like, I did like, I signed with an academy contract and I literally did one month there, maybe not even that. And I started playing um, for Hamilton Old Boys and Club Rugby. And then Chase were like, I don't know, come in. So I literally trained with Chase Monday to Friday and then played Club 40 on the Saturday in my first year in 2015 out of school because I already done like a pre-season after my seventh form year like literally a couple of weeks before Christmas All right. and honestly I went to the gym my first time like, like still still to this day I still get shit about it but <laughs> James Lowe and Brad Weber like watching me and I'm with Phil Healy who's the Blues trainer but was the Chiefs trainer at the time and I'd honestly never been in the gym and <laughs> I'm literally here bench pressing a bar <laughs> Just the bar, <laughs> and honestly, like all the top dogs in there, and I'm literally just pushing a bench. I'm just pushing a bar, and like <laughs> everyone's just looking at it, like, "What the hell?" Like, this kid, like, 
they're not doing any gym at school. And but literally, I was like at that point, I was a year thirteen. I was like seventy five, seventy kgs dripping wet. Yeah. So I was on those like thousand calorie shakes, like three of them a day, just for right. the first two or three years, just trying to pile it on. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, to this day, Brad Webb even goes, you know, brings the fuck. Remember when you um came first came into your gym station, you're only like, <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe it would have been forty kgs, maybe twenty kgs, wasn't that? But like, yeah, you had ten kgs on the slide, and you're only bench pressing forty kgs. I was like, but yeah, I was so skinny back then. <laughs> oh, that's so. And good. probably still, probably still, probably call me skinny now. Yeah, so but it's all good. And what like was rugby always like your pathway? You obviously you look like someone who'd be talented at a lot of different sports. Was there any other sports which you were good at? Oh, um, I played like heaps of touch back in the day. Oh yeah, um, like that was like my summer sport, I guess. And then yeah, I guess it's always been rugby, um, rugby for me. Like yeah, ever since I was a kid, I just grew up playing rugby. And obviously, when you get to school, you want you want to try all the other sports like cricket. And, yeah, what else was there? Touch cricket. Well, I guess you know, like you play volleyball like. Do all these sports, but I guess when you get to secondary schools, you kind of just have to stick to mm. a couple of sports. You know, you either go one one way or the other in terms of choosing a sport. So um, it was touch of rugby for me, and yeah, that was that was just my those two sports probably intertwined into each other, and um, yeah. And then who got you down to who got you down to Waikato and the Chiefs? Like, um, did someone come and approach oh. you <laughs> while you're at school? Yeah, so um, actually, so I made the secondary school team. For New Zealand, and then we had our first game against Fiji and put it all apart. And it was about like 40th minute, or just after half time. And I literally went to score a try. And as I got tackled, I landed um, funny. And as I scored the try, I broke my collarbone. Mm. And um, obviously, gutted because I couldn't play out the rest of the tournament. And then I got a phone call uh, maybe a week later, and it was um, Andrew Strawbridge and Dave Rennie calling me up, asking for a meeting. So I yeah, obviously took it and um, they met me halfway with my mum at Bombay Hills and yeah, obviously didn't look back after that and that was the end of it and I obviously had a few offers to stay in Auckland and Harbour but I literally just went on the academy contract like I had like full PU contracts uh, and other teams but I think just the fact that they met me halfway and you know told me to come down and I guess it all, all worked out in a way because obviously um, so as soon as I got down there maybe four or five months later I got offered a three year contract. Mm. From them, so uh, yeah, those those two got me down there. So yeah, okay, no wonder you um, were only benching twenty kgs. You just broken your collarbone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. but probably why I broke my collarbone is because I had no muscle around it. So <laughs> like, yeah, I was obviously <laughs> I was obviously worked in both ways, but you know, yeah, probably broke my collarbone because I had literally just bone <laughs> all over my. <laughs> I was just skinny. <laughs> And how'd you find it going into um, those environments down there? Obviously, super young, like you said, um, pretty intimidating in the gym. But what about on the field? Did you feel confident? You always looked like a confident kid. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I still joke with this with Brady Retallick every day. We go, oh, you don't bench press on the field. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, obviously, you know, that was probably the thing that was um, keeping me in the game was, you know, probably my school set and stuff like that when I was young. So, obviously, not that strong in the gym and whatnot, but, um, just yeah, my school set and how I played the game when I was obviously a kid. I was obviously pretty uh, pretty daunting coming to that environment because you know they've won a couple of championships before that and they've always been in the finals and stuff like that. And, you know, like my when I was eighteen, I think I had one training literally just before Christmas, so twenty, so yeah, it would have been twenty fifteen. But they, you know, coming into twenty fifteen um, before Christmas, and I did like. We did like a backs on backs scrums and did like a midfield. I think it was like a two two. I was at fullback and stuff like that, and I got the ball out the back and I just see someone come from the corner of my eye. And obviously, like you know, with defenses, you got split the middies and ones on other sides. Saw my corner of my eye, got the ball out the back and boom, grass cutted, sunny ball, straight straight <laughs> to the thigh. I was like, yeah, nice. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to Super Rugby. Um, but yeah. No, obviously, it was having that first year where I actually wasn't contracted, but I was doing like Monday to Friday. Obviously, um, helped a lot because obviously I was in the gym full time and mm. um, was learning a lot off everyone else. So that nah, was good. Yeah, and I remember the Waikato <laughs> side back then was a really young side as well. I remember you had like Anton Leonard Brown, Damien McKenzie all coming <laughs> through about the same time as you, Brad Weber around there, potentially. 
Beaver as well, coming back at some point to steer the ship. But a um, real good uh, young crew where you guys were just playing some real entertaining rugby, eh? Yeah, I think I, was, I think my debut game was against Marcos that, that year up oh, at Waikato yeah. Stadium. Tough um, start. Tough start, yeah. <laughs> tough start. But um, scored on debut, so I'll take oh. that. But um, yeah, obviously we had, we'd be at halfback, Damien at 10, Anton in the, the back line. We had like Declan O'Donnell and Dylan Collier and Mitch Jacobson, Big big Tama, Tommy Afuna, mm. um, Hummy Fiverr, Brian Elwanese. Yeah, like we had a good team, Jacob Skeen. Um, Adam Byrne, like we, yeah, we had a good, good team and it was enjoyable, and we didn't actually have a good, good season that, that year. But um, got to the last game, and I think we were like three and six or something like that, and we had a Ram Freddie Shield challenge, and yeah. um, we managed to upset Hawks Bay and take the shield off them. So we had That's it for right. the summer. So that was pretty cool doing it in your first year, and I haven't won it since. So <laughs> uh, since then, so had a few, had a few challenges, but yeah, haven't haven't been successful. So. Yeah, and that was it was a it was a gun team to be a part of because yeah. obviously we all were sort of starting off on our journeys. Yeah, mate, it's a hard thing to win that shield. Um, but what was the celebration like? I think I remember Weber um, speaking about a little bit in his podcast. But what do you remember of it? Obviously, young eighteen year old, um, probably first big experience in a shield game and shield celebrations. How was it? Yeah, it was out the gate. <laughs> it was out the gate. <laughs> I think Beaver was in the team that year. I think his house had a few celebrations, and yeah, I think I think he had his golf cart around there sometimes. So um, I think that got out, but that got out for a few um, cruises. Um, but yeah, that no, was good fun. Though, obviously, um, first time and after you know, like I said, having a pretty shit season, and then to get the Red Fleet Shield in your last game, yeah, mm-hmm. didn't really care if you won it or not. You had the, you had the shield for summer, so that was that was the next best thing, if not probably better than that yeah mate so good and then talk to me about like your sort of chiefs like when did you first get your debut for the chiefs was that the following year yeah so 2016 i had my first first year and yeah debuted in that first game against the crusaders which was cool so yeah i guess that was the start of the journey there and yeah obviously eight or nine years later here so that's good mate crazy yeah and you're still so young so how did you find the um, step up to Super Rugby? Did you feel it way more intense than what you were playing? Yeah, 100%. I was kind of like, we kind of had this conversation the other day with some of the boys, you know, like we talked about like if you're coming from club level to NPC, it's one of the things where like if you make a few mistakes, you kind of feel like, you know, you're going to get dropped because you actually haven't played that much in terms of like you haven't got that confidence to keep at it. And then mm. it's like, I, and then you go from NPC to Super Rugby, it's the same thing, you know, if you're not an all black. Um, and you're like, it's, you know, you get a couple of games, but you make a couple of mistakes. You kind of, you know, stay in the shell because you're not actually confident at that mm. level yet. Um, and then obviously so forth going up to the All Blacks. But when you're coming back down the ranks in terms of like you're a super rugby player and you've been playing NPC for so long, that's probably why boys carve up at NPC is because they've been doing it for a while. And, you know, like it's that confidence level in terms of, you know, you know if they make a mistake, they can move on and still have a stay in the game. Mm. Um for example, like all black boys coming down to super rugby level, like, you know, like it's exactly the same thing in terms of, you know, if you make a mistake, you know, you you can flush it a lot easier. And yeah, I think, yeah, obviously when you're young and stuff like that, like I said, you're obviously pretty nervous in terms of um, being out there and stuff like that. So I guess it's just like getting that right mental side of things. So um, when you do get that opportunity, that you're ready to take it with both hands. And if you do make a mistake that you're mentally got the edge to, to just, you know, keep at it and keep moving forward. But is that what you sort of put your form down to over the last sort of 12 months where your game's really gone to another level? Oh, 100%. You know, I, I guess it's just like, it's like everyone though, you get that consistent game time, you know, you're going to thrive a lot more because you know, you're, you're getting it, you, you know, you're starting to put things in place and, you know, everyone says, you know, you're a confidence player, but I feel like everyone's a confidence player. Like <laughs> yeah. you can't, you can't get that confidence if you're not playing, you yeah. know, regular footy and, you know, if you're coming in and out, it's, it's hard to get that, that confidence, you know, because you're probably scared of making a mistake, you know, or, mm. you know, shit, am I going to be in the team next week and I haven't even played yet, you know what I mean? Mm. So um, I think a lot of boys feel that way, but probably just don't really speak about it in that in that, in that that context. Yeah, 100%. And even like at the Chiefs at the moment, like you've, you've been there, what, seven, eight years now, and even you guys are still rotating your outside backs a fair bit, eh? Like don't get real consistency on your week-to-week team. Yeah, I guess we've got quality players, you know, but yeah. um, 
yeah, I guess it's just that consistency, I guess, and you know, everyone getting their turn. And you know, like, like I said, like it's it's a tough one, eh? Because there's so many quality players, but mm. getting that regular game time is obviously pretty hard to come by. Yeah, mate, it's interesting, eh? But so why the move to Harbour? Obviously, you were doing well with Waikato and um, enjoying it. Why the move back up north? Oh, this is home for me. Like, obviously, I didn't want to leave, but I think we can, um, you know, even Harbour can be almost like even back then they probably went in the best <laughs> um in the best set of hands in terms of you know like they probably weren't playing the best footy and um i think for my growth and as a player and especially meeting you know with dave rennie and andrew shawbridge was taking an academy contract over signing a you know um, a pu contract which is like a you know obviously a modern team cup contract straight away mm. um was just beneficial for my rugby and i guess you know it's worked out for me in terms of you know fighting because I had academy contract and then still making my team cup down that year. You know, I was on academy contract, but I had a good club season and then was lucky enough to be picked in the modern team cup squad. So, yeah, I guess coming back to Harbour was always home. So I was pretty gutted that I had to leave those boys, but I, I guess I always wanted to come back home. You know, it's like yourself, you know, you always want to you always want to play for your home province. That's who you grew up watching. And it was just always home for me and um, family up here. And Having a bit of a split six months in Auckland, six months in Hamilton was a bit, bit better option than spending 12 months in Hamilton, not going to lie. So. But, yeah. Yeah, and how did you find the difference up there? Like, what was the what was the culture differences between North Harbour and Waikato? Oh, to be honest, I think, like, most my team cup teams probably have all good, good cultures, you know. Mm. Like, it's, I guess it's it's what, you know, the players want it to be. Like, you know, you've got the coaches there, but you got players coming from club rugby, you got players coming from super rugby, you got players sometimes coming down from the All Blacks, you know, I guess having like those core players that have been there for, you know, three or four years to get that culture humming, you know, it's, to be honest, I think Harbour's got one of the best cultures, and I, you know, and obviously going to be a bit quite biased, but like you speak to everyone that comes here and they love their experience there and yeah, that's what we try to do, you know, we have a bit of fun off the field, but um, also, um, enjoy it on the field as well. Mm, yeah, mate. Not many people complain about their um, NPC culture, eh? Like, no. Nah, yeah. It'd be interesting to hear uh, Mumba's opinion on how Tasman compare to <laughs> North Harbour. But um, mm. yeah, sounds like you guys have a pretty cool culture up there as well. So, uh, one thing that's been um, sort of part of your career to date as well is the New Zealand Maldi side. You've been in, in and around that a few times. Um, how have you found those experiences? Yeah. Well, I- I love playing for Māori All Blacks. Like, um, it's one of the best, or however long you're in there, like time of your lives in terms of just immersing yourself with like the culture and you know the the boys are unreal to play with. You learn so much about you know your heritage and just the whole week from start to finish is just you know, it's just unreal. Like, I mean, until you're actually in there, like you, you know, it's it's hard to put it all into words. But yeah, it's just a it's just a great team to be part of, and also there's so much rich history there. Um, you know, from back in the early 1900s to, to now. And, you know, obviously people hear about the jerseys and if you, like, look in detail to the jerseys and stuff like that, there's just so much so much history behind it and why it's like that. So, yeah, it's just always, a, it's always an honour when you get get named in the team because um, you just know it's going to be a, a very, you know, fun week, but also, you know, putting Māori Moldy rugby back on the map and that's what you're trying to do when you you know trying to get tier two you know nation so you can actually play against decent op- opposition to further you know that Moldy rugby and you know keep putting it on the map. Yeah, and I I guess the moment where you really uh, put your name on the international scene, I guess, was uh, the Test series against Ireland, where you had a standout series and like you say, getting to play against quality opposition, um, putting Moldy rugby on on the map again, but. Your form personally, uh, you must have been happy with how that um, series went. Yeah, I was stoked. Um, yeah, obviously, I, I had done my MCL like a grade two. So, you know, I was available for the last few games to break me and uh, didn't get picked. But, you know, to play that first game back after about eight or nine weeks yeah. off mm. against the Island A, well, Island at FMG Stadium. And I guess it was just one of those things where, like, like I said, like I've been there for a while now where, you know, I hadn't played in a while, but I think I was just so excited and. Um, it was a different challenge of playing against Ireland. Yeah, it was just one of those games where you get a few touches on the ball and you feel good about yourself, and yeah. then you get a couple more, and then you know you you know, you've got some space in front of you. And yeah, it was just it was just a main game to play, and obviously nothing like uh, playing at FMG Stadium. Yeah, probably the best field in New Zealand. <laughs> 
Is it? Oh, that's a big call. Cool. <laughs> nah, it's not the I worst. mean, yeah, surface, and the surface is pretty nice to play yeah. on. I think yeah, most people can uh, agree on that. Yeah, yeah. No, it does always have a really good surface for sure. Uh, and another team that you've played for, the Barbarians. Um, mm. When did you play for them? Because I do always love a good Barbarian story. Yeah, well, um, thanks to Brent Gatlin. Um, it was actually Warren Gatlin's last game against uh, Wales. Um, so oh, Brent, Brent put in the good word. He got uh, Duffy, Bryn Hall, and myself. And Bryn was meant to. Bryn Gatlin was meant to play, but he done his um his foot um during Super Rugby, so he was out for a while. But yeah, managed to get on the big bird, fly to Wales, and have a one-off game against Wales at Cardiff, which was I'm obviously never played in Cardiff, but you know, obviously being Warren Gatlin's last game, you know, sixty thousand uh, Welsh fans just you know especially singing their national anthem, and um yeah, it was unreal. It was an unreal experience to be part of, and obviously when you're Pissing up like Monday to Monday to Thursday or something like that. It's yeah, it was uh, <laughs> a few hungover days, and when you go to training, it's just a game of touch, and oh, it was unreal. It was just like yeah, sweet, just rock up and yeah, get get some kid and throw the ball around for touch, and yeah, mate, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Like the prep and like, were you nervous going into the game? Obviously, playing in front of sixty thousand, you're probably still slightly hungover. You've just been on the piss. You yeah. don't really know the game plan. Were you nervous going out onto the field, thinking like, should I haven't prepared very well for this one? Yeah, yeah, that was. That, I wasn't nervous about the game. I was more nervous because I hadn't done any prep beforehand. <laughs> and like, that was like. So obviously, we finished for Harbour, so we had like three or four weeks off, and obviously, you do like a little bit of training, but also you. Don't know, kind of the mood where you're like you know I'm also it's my off season now but yeah um yeah and then you're on the bus for like a whole week and then you have to go play so that was probably the most nerve-wracking thing because obviously you saw you saw you know play the game for you it's not yeah. like you can it's not a game of touch you know? you're actually playing against the international side who yeah. um probably had all these stars playing as well or how, did have all these stars playing how'd you go no nah, we just lost i think we lost by like seven or ten or something like that like it was a close game but um, it was the end of. Oh, so most of the boys have already been on like played two games before that, so they probably already had like a three week hang- like hangover already. So <laughs> um, we had to bring a bit of fizz and energy when we got there because we were the late late comers and yeah, but still good fun. And, you know, obviously going out. Warren G's coming out with you. He's like a obviously the, the Pope there. You know, like yeah. he's the he's the big dog there. You know, he's just getting. You know, don't worry about the players. It's all about Warren Gatlin when you're out, you know, True. getting pictures and autographs and stuff like that. Yeah, it was no. just unreal. Hey, it's crazy. It blows my mind that a team can prepare like that and still, like, run an international team who's been training and preparing for games like this for, like, months and, you know, doing their structures and all this and still, you know, have a competitive game um, against a team that's just been pissing up and not really preparing for it. Yeah. Boys, uh, boys got up for it. Obviously, didn't get the dub, but um, I guess when you uh, put your boots on and switch on, it's all, it's all go. That's it, that's it, and that's footy, I guess. But uh, yeah. obviously, your plan's going forward. Um, we've sort of spoken about that a little bit already. It sounds like you're off to the NRL in 2024, but <laughs> <laughs> what what are your plans? Those are your, like? those are your, those are your, those are your words, uh, Jimmy. Not mine. Yeah, now, what are your plans? Have you thought much further ahead than the Chiefs? Obviously, you've got... NRL circulating. What are your other options here? Stay with the Chiefs. Oh, to be honest, man, I'm, I'm just keeping my options open at the moment. Now. Yeah. Like, just keep letting the footy do the talking, and obviously, just you know, see what pops up, and you know, what my agent can uh, come up with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at the moment, just keeping my options open. Whatever yeah. happens, happens, and yeah. it's one of those you know cliche points. What you know, whatever comes to you, or whatever you know, you you know, just follow your heart. And, yeah, you know, it'll be the right option. Does the Japan market interest you, or um, Europe? Playing rugby in Europe, does any of those ones sort of interest you? Oh, obviously both of them interest you. I guess it's like yeah. one of those things. If you do leave New Zealand, is it? Yeah, you still, you know, you're accomplishing to make the money side of things. You know, like obviously Japan, unreal money there. But or do you go to, I don't know, you know, over the French top fourteen, and you still get that challenge, and mm. you know, you still get that accomplishment of you know, I'm still trying to, you know, still be. You know, obviously Japan's comp is competitive, but. Yeah, you know it's challenging, competitive. The that French one as well, you know. So I guess you just got to look at it in that way, and sort of you know what what do you still want to achieve out of your footy career, um, and then make a decision off that. I guess, mm, mate. Exciting, mate. I'd love to be in your shoes. You're in a good position with the form you're <laughs> in. I'm, I'm sure plenty of uh, clubs will be circling, but. 
Uh, you sort of mentioned a little bit before around um, your water truck. So plans for after footy. Have you got much in plan um, life post footy? Are you going to looking to take this water business globally? Yeah, I don't know about globally, but um, I think you know you obviously get into housing and you know I've got my own house and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I guess business is a different different beast, and I think you can like, take a lot out of um, being in a team environment. Mm. You know, with a footy team being in a professional environment, we're pretty fortunate and lucky to always have people come in and have um, you know PD talks um, about you know what we want to do, and or people coming in who've been in that um, area before and giving you some tips and stuff like that. So. Oh, I always, you know, even at school, like my favorite topic to study and well, my favorite subject was business studies. So, mm. um, yeah, I guess you learn a lot from that as well in terms of what you do in rugby and transfer some of that to business and then what you learn in business and you transfer that into rugby, you know, mm. like it's, it yeah, actually has quite a few um, similarities. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully uh, I have my own, my own business and oh, yeah, I've got that now, but. Um, you never know what's going to happen uh, ten years down the track, or um, yeah. So, but yeah, at the moment the water truck, water truck business is is all good, you know. It's yeah. keeping ticking over. Hey, that's interesting. It's interesting that you've jumped into it so early while you're still playing. You're like you'll be learning so much from what you're doing at the moment, and just like even if it doesn't go that well, um, what you would have learnt while you're doing it when you get to the end of your footy career, mate, you would have learnt so much, and you'll be in such a good position to start your own business and whatever you want but um, I'm sure the water truck is going to go humming because everyone needs some water in their life. Yeah, 100% everyone needs water so um, yeah, we'll see how that goes but yeah, like like you said like if it doesn't work, it doesn't work but yeah. you can learn a lot from it and um, be better off, you know but hopefully I don't get to that, that stage, I can get it up and running and then if I don't want to do it anymore, I can sell it off and yeah, that's it. not have to not have to crash and burn, but, but um, yeah, we'll see where it goes, how it goes, bro. But yeah, at the moment, second second season in, so try to get it humming and have a good summer. Love it. Mate, as always, I've gone to the Instagram for some questions and, mate, plenty have come through. Obviously, 90% of them were around um, the NRL switch and the Dolphins and all that, so uh, we've pretty much covered all of that. Also, heaps of them were filthy that you hadn't made the ABs 15, so we've covered that as well. But we'll fly through the rest of them. Um, how'd you get the nickname Shooter? This must be a good yarn. Oh, uh, a little bit of a yarn, but I oh, was just watching um, Happy Gilmore before our first ever game for Waikato. It was, um, I was planning with um, Damien and Anton, and yeah, we were literally just watching it the night before. And it was just, yeah, I guess we'll just make a bit of an inside joke. and. Um, yeah, obviously managed to score on debut the night the, the night after and um shoot in the game and you know, obviously was one of the main characters in that team and um I guess the only way to act out like shooting McGavin was to shoot the camera. So <laughs> that's how it's going about and it's stuck um <laughs> since then. So yeah. <laughs> Mate, it has stuck. Everyone calls you shooter yeah. now, eh? Just from that. That's that's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I got a, I got a video from the actual shooting McGavin last year when we were in Coogee Beach. Oh, I yeah, I year, saw um, that. Piss up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I got a little person up. Well, not, it was still the team, but yeah. managed to say that. Yeah, you know, I heard this. Is, he said this. I heard there's another shooter in the team, but there's only one one shooter McGavin in this world. So that was quite funny. <laughs> That's right. I did see that. That was gold. Cool. <laughs> the real shooter. Okay, next one. Best Damien and Anton Flatting story. Oh. I don't know about the best story, but there's been there was one like story, like stalking story, like yeah, it was like I don't know who they were, but they were probably stalking um, Damien, but no, like no shit, like they would follow us to like the New World, like they would park outside our house, and we would jump in the car, go to like go to like the New World, they'd like follow us from behind, and like they probably did it for about a week or two, True. and one time they like followed us to the New World, and then we're like fuck, we like we clicked onto it and like shit like, at least like we've got a bit of stalkers in and then like we'll park up and then like we'll like go inside and then we'll walk back out and like maybe like they'll park down the road like 50 to 100 meters oh fuck this is weird like they didn't do anything but we're yeah. like what's going on here like it was out the gate and then one time well it might have been like Christmas time and they followed me all the way up to Rainbow's Inn <laughs> oh, shit, from, from your house Allison to Rainbow's Inn Holy. yeah it was out the gate it was crazy it was crazy, like, 
And so then I'll see you. You're thinking you're like need for speed and you're like going weaving in between traffic. So you're like, what's going on here? Like, I need, like this is just getting too much. So, um, yeah, that was probably one of the, like, that was, yeah, that was probably one of the stories. That was just crazy. Was, All right. Were they just weaving in and out of traffic behind you? Like, no. Nah, nah. Well, yeah, not, like I lost them. Like, oh, I yeah. lost them, but like, yeah, they followed me and I was like, because obviously you knew the, what the car looked like because it had been, you know, outside your house for a couple of weeks. But, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just, oh, jeez. Who were they? Like, like what sort of age? Was or? Two checks. Like, two two checks. checks. Like, oh, true. Probably like, probably still at school or something like that. Like, it was out the game. True. Just fell probably in love with Shooter Damien. and um, D-Mac. No, nah, probably just D-Mac. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so, that was like, yeah, that was a crazy story. I was just, yeah. Jeez, that is, that is crazy. That's good stuff. Okay, next yeah. one. This one came in probably um, almost as much as your NRL stuff. Um, why did it take you so long to pay the lawns? The lawns. Oh, well, I'm actually not living in Hamilton, so they actually so getting Rankin comes out and cuts my lawn, so obviously he's making the chief. So, oh yeah, um, yeah, probably because he earns too much money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Biggest nudge you've ever kicked training or game? Obviously, that big one in the uh, NPC from sixty that was massive. Yeah, that's probably my biggest because I had a lot of. Um, people on my back about me just being a training kicker <laughs> and it was actually quite funny because the week before we're in the Macargo and we went up for a few beers and obviously marty banks being marty banks thinks he's you know thinks he's a joker and he, you know he couldn't remember because i said to him i actually messaged him after i kicked that 60 meters but he said that night that if i could anything over 50 meters that he would post on the story saying that sean stevenson's got a bigger boot than marty banks so oh, yeah when I messaged him after the game, I sent him the video and I said, I just sent him the video and I didn't say anything. And then he tried to call me and he was in Queenstown on the, I think he was on the plus having, you know, this <laughs> up and, um, break up. But yeah, so yeah, probably I had to get a lot of people on my back because they were just going, Sean, you're just a training ticket. You're training, you're training ticket. They're like, uh, I had them in kittens run from like 60 yards and stuff like that. But had a few opportunities this year and that first game against Auckland and missed. And then, yeah, obviously to get that one on the, against Auckland was, um, the monkey off the back, which was uh, quite nice. Yeah, nice. You struck it well, 60 metres. Were you confident as soon as you hit it? Uh, I was confident because it was going straight and, like, yeah, it's always nice when you know, like, when it comes off the boot, but obviously just went over. But, um, yeah, I kind of, like, turned around. And I was like, yeah, I hit that nicely. And then I had to, like, kind of, like, take a look again <laughs> to make sure, because hey, I wasn't sure that I had the, I had the legs. <laughs> Next question. Okay, this one's a weird one, but is it true you gave a random guy at Hidden Valley your shorts because his were lost and you just walked around all night in your jocks? What a lad. <laughs> well, I don't think I no, I don't think I did. No, I'm like, <laughs> but then again, like, at Hidden Valley, you know, you're probably, you're probably intoxicated. So, uh, unless you maybe swap shorts because he was getting chased by security or something and I was just being a yeah, good dude and just swap shorts so he didn't get kicked out. Oh, what a lad. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, two more questions. This one came in a couple of times. Would you play for the Warriors? Obviously, a lot of Warrior fans out there. Oh, never say never if they offered. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll be listening, so um, they'll be probably kind of nah. calling. It worked for Geordie. <laughs> Who knows, mate, next week. Once this is released, it's, they're coming. Okay, last question. Best piece of advice you have for a Water Lad listener? Love finishing with... Some advice. I'll probably go touch on that point I said about the confidence thing. Yeah, really, like, um, it's probably just sticking at it. Like, you know, once you once it's like muscle memory, you know, and something that you actually truly believe that you're good enough to be there, it's probably just sticking at it. Like, you know, like there's a lot of players that probably are good enough to be there, but it's that mental side of things. So there's probably not much separating other boys in the same position, but some other boys might just have a better mental um, capacity. So probably just sticking at it and just keep trying like, and believing in yourself that you are good enough to be there. 100%. Oh, you, you, the further you go away, the more you notice is how little difference there is like physically and all that between players. Eh? It is that mental difference and being able yeah. to stay in the moment and you know all those things you talk about. That's the game. Eh? That's the difference between the good players and the greats. Yeah, 100%. Mate, love that advice from you. What a way to finish one of the great podcasts. Um, awesome to catch up. Thanks for jumping on. I know you're 
Um, everyone's wanting to talk to you at the moment with the rumours circling, but I um, appreciate you giving up your time and jumping on and really excited to see what's next for you. Um, like I said, I'm pretty keen to see you on the NRL, but also um, it'd be great to have you stay here in Rugby Union, but really appreciate you coming on, mate. No, no, awesome. Thanks for having me. Obviously, uh, obviously what a lad has uh, got me before with the, with the joke, so it's obviously <laughs> nice to just have a normal chat and not talk about DVD stores. So, uh, no, I appreciate, appreciate Jimmy doing a, obviously a, a good thing in the rugby world of all these podcasts, so that's no, cool. Appreciate it, brother. What a lad, what a lad.